Hello and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week we welcome Professor Seiji Sugita of the University of Tokyo to the show. He is a researcher on the Hayabusa 2 mission which recently brought the first large sample of an asteroid to Earth. But first, we take a look at a new study teaching us how spiders react to living in space. Next, we journey to the exoplanet HD 10696b and learn what it could teach us about a possible unseen planet at the edge of our own solar system. Finally, we'll take a look at the first large samples of an asteroid ever to arrive on Earth before we talk to one of the researchers on this historic mission. Researchers at the University of Basel examined two experiments conducted in 2008 and 2011 in which spiders were brought to the International Space Station to see how they would adapt to life in space. Webs built by these spiders were more symmetrical than webs constructed on Earth, and spiders changed their hunting techniques. However, researchers found that simulating sunlight in the chambers drove the spiders to construct webs similar to those found here at home. Suggesting light is an important tool spiders use in constructing their silky nets. Located roughly 336 light years from Earth, the exoplanet HD 10696b may teach us about Planet X, a theoretical unseen planet at the edge of our solar system. This exoplanet, 11 times as massive as Jupiter, may have formed fairly close to its pair of parent stars. Drag from a disk of gas and dust could have sent the planet spiraling inward before being sent out to a far-flung, if stable, orbit. It is possible an unseen ninth planet in our own solar system might have followed a similar path, researchers speculate. On December 22nd, we'll talk to Dr. Paul Collis, an astronomer at UC Berkeley, who helped lead this study. The Hayabusa 2 mission to collect material from the asteroid Ryugu has successfully dropped its cargo on Earth. The sample was found to contain gas, which researchers carefully collected as the sample container was opened. It is uncertain so far if this gas found with the sample is native to the asteroid. The canister will be carefully emptied of its precious cargo and the material analyzed. Analysis of this rare material could help researchers learn more about the early solar system, including the formation of Earth. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk to Professor Seiji Sugita of the University of Tokyo, researcher on this fascinating study.
This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to, happy to be joined once again by Professor Seiji Sugita from the University of Tokyo. He is a researcher on the Hayabusa 2 mission, which recently returned the first large samples of an asteroid to Earth. Welcome to the show, Seiji. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you for having me here again. It's uh, such an honor to talk oh. to your audience. Yeah, thank you. It's great to have you back. Um, so just to uh, let people know, uh, what do we know so far about the asteroid Ryugu and what makes it such an interesting target to study? Okay, um, after a year and a half of uh, intensive uh, observation with the Hayabusa 2, uh, we know a lot more about the Ryugu now than just before the arrival. We had, we had little uh, knowledge about the asteroid except for a few important things. But now I think we have uh, three important properties of Ryugu, a shape, carbon, and water. Uh, the number one, shape. Uh, it has a, a so-called top shape, uh, just like the, the my virtual yep, background. Yeah, behind it's, you, yep. Yeah, it's spinning like a top, and then uh, it's uh, axisymmetric. Uh, if you look from the top, it's a perfect sphere, uh, but it looks like a, um, a diamond shape from the side, and then it's spinning this way. And then the size is very small. It's like uh, almost exactly one kilometer in diameter, which is about, 0.6 miles uh, across. And then the surface is, and then number two is a carbon. The surface is very dark. Uh, this is one of the darkest objects in the solar system. Uh, comets are very dark, known to be dark, but the, this particular asteroid um, uh, turns out to be as dark as a comet surface. And the reflectance is less than actually 2%. Uh, only 2% of light is coming um, uh, from the surface uh, compared to the sunlight. And then this darkness is probably uh, most likely uh, uh, comes from the uh, high abundance of carbon. Mm -hmm. So organic matter, which is carbon-based molecules, and also building blocks of uh, our body, uh, of life, uh, are also uh, very likely to be contained. So we hope to be able to find many carbon-based molecules from the samples we obtained just recently. And the third element is water. Uh, water is a very important ingredient of life and also ocean and other things on the earth. And we have found evidence for uh, water, but chemically bound in the minerals, not the liquid water, but the chemically bound uh, uh, minerals on uh, Ryugu. We call those minerals that contain water, uh, hydrated minerals, and clay is uh, uh, one of the most typical uh, hydrated minerals. We don't think we have, well, we may have a clay, but some other little more obscure form of uh, hydrated minerals on Ryugu. That's something we would have to find out from the samples. Then uh, also, the amount of water on Ryugu is uh, substantially less than we thought before the arrival. And also, maybe we talk about it later, but uh, Bennu. Bennu is uh, NASA's, uh, U.S. NASA's uh, uh, um, mission's uh, uh, target asteroid. Uh, very similar shape and color, but they found much more abundance of uh, uh, chemically bound uh, water on Bennu. So the contrasting difference between uh, uh, Bennu and Ryugu in terms of uh, uh, water abundance is a very interesting and a puzzling uh, question we're asking ourselves, and hopefully we can answer those questions by uh, sample analysis. So that's a sort of a, what we know about Ryugu in a nutshell. It's a little long-winded, but uh, that's what we think we know. That, that's so informative. So do you think that possibly um, the difference in water content means that Bianu and um, Ryugu, Ryugu have, Ryugu, yes, have, uh, have Different, come from different sources, or are they from? Yeah, we have a, a multiple hypotheses, and then maybe all of them are wrong. <laughs> but they, uh, <laughs> like you uh, said, uh, uh, well, there are generally two schools of thought. Like you said, one which I hope I uh, I hope to be true uh, is that those Ryugu and Bennu are from uh, two different parent bodies. Uh, they were formed in a 
uh, slightly different locations in the solar system early on, and somehow the amount of water uh, was different, and then uh, there's, there must have been some kind of mechanism to determine the amount of the water in early on, and then depending on which type of asteroids come into the Earth later on the uh, solar system evolution, the amount of water we receive in the Earth and terrestrial, other terrestrial planets like uh, Venus or Mars uh, could be controlled by those uh, frequency of the impact. So that has an important uh, uh, implication. The other th uh, school of thought is that maybe uh, Bennu and Ryugu are born in a, even a possibly the same parent body, the same initial water abundance, and then somehow it lost the water through the, the evolution, possibly the impact and the degassing and the water get evaporated, or maybe in the process of uh, going to the uh, uh, proximity to the sun in the recent history of orbital evolution, it may have evaporated. And then we don't see as much water on Rigu than Venu. So uh, then there are a lot of slightly divided uh, uh, hypotheses right now. So that's just the general style that's the of understanding. Uh, that is so fascinating. And of course, you mentioned um, the, all the carbon, you know, the carbon-based molecules that you're expecting to find um, within the sample. Um, and so, of course, when you think carbon, one of the first things that springs to mind often is, as you mentioned, life. Uh, right. And so there's been some fascinating research going on lately talking about how the building blocks of life or possibly even life itself could be transported, especially through asteroids. Are you going to be able to detect any of those materials in, right. your, in your research? The, uh, the short answer to that profound question is, of course, <laughs> yes and no, you know, it's a silly answer, and I hate to say that. But uh, uh, the no part is that because we haven't opened the, the, the canister yet, we don't know what's inside yet. I and mean, that's the official statement, I have to say. I mean, you can't speculate, but it's meaningless. But the yes part is uh, uh, actually we can say even more strongly today than just a week ago, the, uh, the, the condition of the container or the capsule of Hyosa 2 is really perfect. It cannot be better than that. That's a really wonderful news. Uh, if the return of the capsule uh, was not as good as it did, or maybe the, the amount of time it took uh, from the arrival to the Earth's atmosphere to the, the uh, retrieval, finding, and bringing to the, uh, the safe location in the vacuum chamber. Maybe some uh, Earth's atmosphere uh, gradually uh, gets into the uh, uh, system. And you can't have a 100% air tightness. I mean, it's really tight, but the, we're talking about PPD and PPM, very low amount of high detectability of those uh, uh, biomolecules. But the, the, I, I think that the samples we have uh, from Hypsa 2 is as good as it can be. As uh, Earth, so we call it Earth contamination, uh, uh, as Earth contamination free as uh, possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, whatever uh, molecules that could be useful for generating a life on Earth uh, in the sample, it is uh, born in the space not the uh, contamination from the ground. That's something we can say for sure. So it's up to what kind of molecules we will find in coming months and maybe years of time. And then uh, in the past, in a meteoritic sample, uh, even if we find some really great molecules such as amino acid, sugars, and uh, uh, lipid, uh, those uh, it's difficult to distinguish between the, uh, the uh, real meteoritic sample or earth contamination. But that issue is taken care of from this uh, uh, hypothetical sample. Uh, the meteoritic uh, analysis and study in the past have shown a great possibility of finding those molecules. So we hope to be able to find these uh, exciting molecules in the uh, near future. That's 
<clears throat> so interesting. And so, of course, that begs the question of how is this done? Can you tell us a little bit about the Hayabusa spacecraft and and okay. how it, how it how it went out and captured a little bit of this fabulous asteroid? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, let me then, uh, yeah, uh, go through the. Uh, well, not the, well, uh, first it got launched, right? And then uh, it went through this uh, asteroid and then made a uh, 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 global observation with the instrument. And um, among them is my uh, instrument, which is a visible camera on a multi-band camera. And then uh, along with that, uh, thermal infrared and the near infrared spectrometers and then a, a, a later a laser altimeter, those were used to characterize. And then we went close to the surface, made a very detailed observation, and then uh, chose a place to uh, land. And then uh, we got the, the first sample from the touchdown one. We call it touchdown instead of a landing because it just touches and it go. And mm -hmm. not really <laughs> landing uh, very stably. Uh, it is effective because it's a very low gravity uh, and then after that, we made an artificial impact. Uh, this was the first time to have a, a man-made crater on the surface of an asteroid. Then we excavated material from subsurface. Subsurface material is extremely useful or precious uh, because it doesn't experience, it hasn't experienced a major uh, uh, so-called space weathering, uh, uh, organic matters and other uh, 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 delicate matters could be altered if you expose those material in your space for a long time. It's not that good. It's not good for analyzing biomolecules. So bringing some subsurface material on the ground uh, was a very uh, important process. And then we landed on the uh, 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 ejector deposit excavated from a subsurface of Ryugu made by the impact crater. Then that's the uh, second touchdown. Then uh, after a little while, uh, we left the Ryugu in uh, this, uh, November of last year. Then about a year, year of time of a cruising, uh, we came to the Earth on the 6th of uh, December of this year, just uh, one week ago. Can't believe that was just uh, uh, one week ago, but came down to the Australia. We have a very good relationship with Australia. My goodness, the, the COVID-19 situation didn't help us at all, but the, the Australian government and then the local scientists were extremely, extremely helpful. And then uh, uh, they, they really helped us. And, and then, uh, about 80 people from JAXA went to the Australia after the self quarantining two weeks, two weeks in Japan, two weeks in Australia, went to the desert and wow. then, uh, obtained a capsule. Then brought in the uh, uh, next day, uh, they found in the same day, uh, uh, just after the dawn, uh, they, they detected the, the uh, beacon signal uh, really close to where it looked like landed based on the optical and the radio navigation. And then a helicopter found it as soon as light came in. And then the, the, and the bush was retrapping the uh, parachute, then landing, and then grabbed the uh, a capsule. And then on the night of the seventh, uh, they left uh, the Australia with a pretty small uh, charter the airplane, a jet airplane. And then on the morning of the uh, eighth, uh, the aircraft landed on the uh, Haneda Airport in Tokyo, and then brought the capsule to the uh, Sangamihara campus of JAXA. Now it's uh, hiding in a, <laughs> a curation facility uh, for. Uh, careful examination. It's going to take a long time to open this uh, 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 capsule. If we somehow make a mistake and let the uh, Earth's atmosphere in, that's the end of it. <laughs> right, <laughs> well, right. We can still do some good science, but the, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the one of the advantages of uh, Earth contamination-free property will be lost. So they're having a very, very hard, uh, hard uh, intense moment. Uh, of a uh, uh, preparation of opening the capsule. So that's what, oh, I'm sorry, I left some time. Right. Yeah. So can you yeah. talk a little bit about how you are uh, keeping this sample safe from contamination 
and protecting yeah. it um, while it's being examined. Yes, um, uh, uh, there are three uh, uh, elements. Uh, number one is that the capsule uh, has to have a very vacuum seal. Uh, uh, that was uh, one of the uh, main uh, advancement uh, from uh, the original Hibisa. Hibisa had the, uh, the uh, 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 resin uh, type uh, sealing of the capsule. It was not necessary mm. to have a high vacuum sealing, but this time it's a very uh, uh, tight uh, metal uh, vacuum sealing, which is used in high vacuum uh, conditions in the Earth is a uh, uh, high precision laboratory on the ground. Mm-hmm. And then the number two was the timing. As I mentioned a little bit, uh, the amount of time they were allowed to spend uh, uh, from uh, uh, arrival of the capsule to the ground to the retrieval and then the uh, uh, um, uh, 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 enclosure with the uh, contamination free environment is uh, only uh, 72 hours. I uh, have to check back. I think it's, it was uh, 72 hours. And then it was done much uh, shorter time than that amount of time. So that was really extra uh, successful. And then the third element is, of course, the ground facility. Uh, the ground facility has been extremely clean and then uh, the, the capsule was put it into the system and then after thorough, thorough uh, cleaning of the capsule inside of the vacuum chamber, it would be opened. And then the, the facility has a very tight control of uh, people. Uh, I will have a chance to uh, go down there to make a measurement of a sample later on, but no, I cannot uh, come in, let's say today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> only only people uh, who who are really needed to do the, uh, the analysis uh, are allowed to come in. Even the uh, facility uh, manager, the person who is in charge of the whole thing, cannot be uh, uh, get in because this is the source of uh, dust and then the contamination. That's how uh, uh, they they control the the contamination, and hopefully that will work out. Oh, well. So we know, and so of course, obviously, as you said, it's only been a week or so since it's landed. But do we know anything at all so far about the sample? What do, do yeah, we even, um, go ahead. Yeah. What, do, what do we know? Yeah, one thing uh, they have uh, uh, they have announced so far is that they could de- detect some kind of gas uh, from the chamber. That was measured back in Australia. Uh, that was exactly how it was planned. Uh, I, I, I thought, well, it, it is in common sense. Uh, it's not that easy. Uh, the the material uh, was uh, exposed to the space, you know, super ultra uh, high vacuum for uh, at least a thousands of years, if mm-hmm. not millions of years. So the gassing must have happened, but they the, they could detect some gas that's not uh, uh, from our Earth. So that's a uh, great news. Yeah, so it, it tells you, uh, tells us two things. One is that there is an ample sample inside. And number two, it's got some uh, fresh uh, material. It's not really all dried out. So it's mm. as, uh, as promising as it could be. I'm a little bit uh, worried because all the news are too good. <laughs> yes, if there's some little problem, it's like, all right, yeah, yeah, this is the reality. But uh, th- th- that's, that's the, uh, the level. Uh, they have been very, very cautious, and so far it's good. Yeah, so that's where we stand. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I probably have an interview just about the gas, to tell you the truth. But uh, <laughs> um, so how are you handling the sample? Like when NASA got its, you know, moon samples from the Apollo missions if they, you know, were really strict about handling it. But some but some samples got sent out to universities and organizations around the world. How are you handling distributing this yes. precious material? Yeah. Um, well, we knew that once we have a sample, everybody wants to have it. And it's good to really distribute among the best scientists of the world. At the same time, somebody has to be there and, uh, and then do the so-called curation 
to really characterize. Uh, this is a big piece, this is a small piece, and this is darker than the other. Who gets what? And those called the uh, initial curation. And then they have talked about the your premise and some of the analyzing people have talked about it for a long time. And then uh, 40% uh, will be stored in uh, for future uh, research. Uh, uh, we are still uh, learning more and more. But the rest of the 60 will be uh, used for the analysis in the relatively near future, like maybe uh, six months through a few years, maybe a little bit more. Um, then then the 30%, well, I don't need to really explain that, you know, huge details, but the, generally 30% including that initial curation process and the initial analysis will be done in Japan. So the Japanese scientists will have the hands on to those samples. Yeah. <laughs> But rest of the 30% uh, goes to the International Science Community. And then, uh, uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the, 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 out of the 30, uh, 15 has been uh, already assigned to uh, 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 space agencies uh, and then uh, some other universities overseas. And then, uh, and then uh, NASA actually gets the uh, one third of the international allocation, which is uh, 10% of the total amount of mass. It's uh, the biggest share of uh, any single uh, organization uh, receives. But um, uh, this is because uh, 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 NASA helped us for the operation greatly. And also, uh, we have a, a packed agreement uh, with the uh, OSIRIS-REx to exchange uh, respective samples. So oh, we sorry. provide, yeah, Osiris Rex uh, team with the, the sample analysis, uh, and then uh, well, they get to analyze it uh, before their arrival of their own sample, which is yeah. going to help. Yeah, but we will get their samples. Luckily, they have an ample amount of sample. Uh, well, more than they were expecting to get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was so large amount that uh, it was kind of like uh, uh, falling away. But I, you know, some some media covered that. Oh, it was a leaking, leaking. But I think it's like an overspill. Just right. so much. Of, well, yeah. I'm not there, but uh, yeah, that's right. the impression I received. So um, they get the sample. We will get the uh, Osiris Rex's sample, and then uh, we'll have a, a, a laboratories who are used to uh, who practice with the high two two uh, real good samples. Then make a compare with uh, with the Osiris. And then Osiris and the Hayabusa to a pretty much simultaneous mission. So the same laboratory, same people uh, can get to use those uh, different types of uh, samples. So the, the level of uh, expertise is not going to deteriorate in a year, a uh, matter of uh, three years. Probably it's going to just increase. And that was kind of happening, what, what was happening during the Apollo era, because Apollo was not uh, just a single mission. Uh, Apollo 11, we see example, 12 was going to receive, 13 didn't work out, but the you know, major heroic story and 14, 15, 16. So the, the laboratory are really working hard back then to really sharpen their really uh, techniques uh, over the years of time, not as extensive and massive as Apollo time, but the, this uh, one, two mission with a very similar asteroid, but the Clearly different um, asteroid, with a different amount of water, and then probably organic types are quite different. Oh, wow, if I was your chemist, I'd be really looking at my microprobe every day. It's really worth doing. So that's what we are trying to uh, achieve. You know, reality is not as uh, ideal as I just uh, depicted, but that's what we are trying to do. And then those uh, portion numbers, uh, 40%, 30%, 30%, future us and then the international science community that's the number we're trying to project our thoughts in and then that makes uh, some uh, um, uh, important impression to the uh, science community and the rest of the world yeah it sounds like there's gonna be some great science coming out of it and so finally you know Hayabusa 2 came and dropped the capsule containing this you know material off at earth and then it took off leaving leaving the gravitational grip of the earth and where is it headed what's what's next for Hayabusa 2 right 
Um, uh, the next goal or destination is uh, another asteroid. Uh, it's called the uh, 1998 uh, KY26. It was hard to remember, but now I think I remember it correctly. And uh, it's a very interesting asteroid. Uh, it's a, a small asteroid, only 30 uh, meters across, about 100 wow. feet across. Uh, it's a, just a little, slightly larger than the large meteorite that uh, uh, fell on uh, Russia, uh, Chelyabinsk, uh, town of Chelyabinsk in Russia. Uh, I think it's uh, 2013. About seven years ago, and they made a huge uh, shock wave, and then they broke a uh, lot of uh, glass windows, and they injured right. a few thousand people. And that was uh, estimated to be about 18 meters, uh, you know, about 20 meters, so two thirds of uh, uh, KY 26. And then uh, this guy, uh, KY 26, uh, so uh, getting close to the range of a size that could really fall on the Earth. And then knowing the properties of those small, small asteroids are going to be extremely useful for protecting ourselves from a possible um, um, upcoming uh, impact on a civil civilization. And hopefully we may be able to di redirect the, the orbit and so forth. That's one thing. And then the second thing is that the, uh, of the pro properties of uh, uh, KY26 is that it's a so-called a fa first a fast rotator. Uh, it probably has a similar shape. Uh, the radar has a, uh, uh, we have a radar image. Uh, um, uh, the the radar uh, astronomers have found uh, the general shape. It's a, a potato shape, it's a round, not the uh, elongated like the uh, Itokawa, but the, uh, the uh, it spins every 10 minutes. It's very fast. Uh, Rigu has a seven and 7.6 hours of a rotation period compared to that. It's really fast rotating. So it's maybe monolith, but it could be, again, uh, a tightly interlocked uh, uh, rubble pile. A rubble pile is an uh, uh, assemblage of an uh, uh, asteroid made by uh, small fragments kind of clustered together, just like a uh, um, uh, very good. And then uh, knowing those uh, natures of uh, fast rotators uh, and then uh, the internal structure would be extremely interesting and for understanding the origin of the asteroids and the evolution of the solar system. And that's the uh, two major goals. But uh, it takes uh, uh, 11 years to get there. So uh, it's a very long, long journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to really preserve the spacecraft. Uh, we have to pet them. Well, not really in a physical hand, but the, <laughs> with the command line. Well, you, you did a good job, uh, but he or she, no, doesn't have to have a gender, but the, yeah, the Hibs 2 uh, has a, a very quiet uh, journey uh, to a new destination. And hopefully, we will do some uh, interesting signs by using our cameras or spectrometer, looking at the different objects in the solar system, and then finding out uh, those uh, uh, undiscovered uh, 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 properties of the solar system. We have to find out what we're going to do yeah, in some time. Okay. So that's our plan. Thank you so much for being on this on this show, Seiji. It's great talking with you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, that was Professor Seiji Sugita of the University of Tokyo, researcher on the Hayabusa two mission. Next week, we welcome Dr. Paul Kalis from UC Berkeley to the show. He is an astronomer who is a leader on the study of the exoplanet HD 10696b, which might resemble an unseen planet X in our own solar system. Tune in for this episode coming December 22nd. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists speaking directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. 
and we depend on support from viewers just like you. To help support this program with a one-time donation or a paid subscription starting at just 99 cents a month, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.